So we published a paper out of Cornell three years ago now in which we said, be careful, a very small amount of leakage is really, really bad, and we really don't know how much is leaking. We said two things in our paper. Be careful, a very small amount of leakage is very bad because of that multiplying factor, and we don't know how much is leaking. But we made a guess. And since we didn't have any data, since no one had ever measured how much was leaking, we estimated from various sources that it could be this much, it could be this much, the answer is probably somewhere in between, but we don't know. And then we said, somebody better go out and start making the measurements. Because it's really important, because a small amount of leakage has a really big effect. So we published this paper and we compared shale gas to conventional gas to coal to oil, and we showed that even the best possible case, the least amount of leakage that we can possibly imagine, roughly about 3% of all the natural gas produced from shale gas wells is going to get into the atmosphere without being burned. Under that best scenario, that makes shale gas not the clean, not the cleaner, but the dirtiest of all fossil fuels because you have to take into account methane and carbon dioxide. And we got pillory. It's okay, we said fine. We did our best job and the most important thing we said was make measurements. So scientists do. We, we made a prediction. The best available guess is what we did. And we said go out and make measurements. And now the measurements are starting to come in, so I'm going to report them to you. Uh, and these are done by government scientists from NOAA and by scientists from Stanford, Harvard, Purdue, Penn State, Cornell, Duke, Boston University, very prestigious places, and published in the very, very most prestigious journals in the last year. All of the literature, in the, all the peer-reviewed scientific literature on the question of how much methane is leaking has been published in the last 12 months. All of it. January 2013, 13 months. We're in February. 9% uh, of the total production of methane in Utah is leaking. Uh, December 2012, 2.3 to 7% of all the oil and all the natural gas produced in the Denver, Denver Julesburg Basin of Colorado is leaking. Boston. This is a map of Boston, an unusual map of Boston. So these scientists uh, from Duke and Boston University drove every mile of every street in Boston, continually che checking for methane concentration in the atmosphere. Why would there be methane in the atmosphere of Boston? Because there's methane in the atmosphere of this room, you're now currently breathing 1.9 parts per million methane. That's the natural background level of methane on the face of the Earth, on average. Take a deep breath. Don't worry about lighting up. 1.9 parts per million. You're not going to explode. Okay? But that's the natural background. Everything that's red here is measured as natural background. They drove the street. If they got 1.9 parts, nothing's... Every place that's not red is unnatural. It comes from pipeline leakage. Underneath all the streets in Boston, and I suspect underneath the streets of Canandaigua, are natural gas. You had them all fixed? They won't, they're, the city of they won't up place. they're all plastic now? Well, the radar, oh, good. <laughs> if they're plastic, good. Okay, so Boston, there's hundreds of miles of streets, and so in, in some places they're measuring 15 times background. Here's natural background, that's what they're measuring, that's Boston. Here's LA, here's the 1.9 parts per million natural background. They've got hundreds of parts per million over the oil fields in downtown Los Angeles. And most recently, name the city. This is a paper that came out uh, in December of this year. So they drove all 1,500 miles of the cities of D.C. They found 5,893 pipeline leaks. And they found concentrations of methane in the atmosphere as high as 54 parts per million. It's 20 times the background. So there's a hell of a lot of gas leaking. What pipelines are you talking about? Distribution lines, the lines that take the gas into the buildings. What about, what about sewer lines? Sewer lines can also emit natural gas, except that it's not called natural gas, it's called sewer gas, and it's distinctly chemically different 
from the gas that's in the distribution lines. It's not what's called thermogenic gas, it's biogenic gas. And that's not, it's not included here. This is all thermogenic gas from pipelines. How can they know that it's coming out of pipelines? How would you know that the pipeline taking natural gas into your house is leaking? You'd smell it because an odorant is added. Okay, so they can detect the odorant and they know that this gas is coming out of natural gas pipelines. Natural gas is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Methane, you can't smell it, you can't see it, you can't taste it. So to, for safety, they put an odorant in the gas before it gets to your house. So if you have a leak, you smell it. Okay, the most recent paper, actually, no, this is the most recent paper. The one right before that in November looked at the entire central, southern, and western United States. Again, NOAA. These are NOAA scientists and industry sci and, and uh, academic scientists. <coughs> Anthropogenic emissions of methane in the United States. That's the title of the paper. They spent five years <laughs> flying over most of the states, but not the Northeast. They didn't fly over the Northeast up until 2008, which means before a lot of the shale gas development happened in the Northeast. And uh, they used aircraft, trucks, cars, tall towers and measured methane concentration in the atmosphere. And here are some of their conclusions, the most important of which is this one. The United States Environmental <coughs> Protection Agency recently decreased its methane emission factors for fossil fuel extraction and processing by 25 to 30 percent. They did that late last year under pressure from the White House and under pressure from the industry. Neither the White House nor industry measures anything. They estimate. The EPA does not measure methane emissions. They estimate based on political input and based on what the industry tells them is leaking. Only in the last two years have people actually going out and measured. So now we have a fight between two government agencies. EPA estimates, NOAA measures. You believe who you want to believe. NOAA says, we find, this is an exact quote from the paper, we, NOAA, find that methane data from across North America instead indicate the need for a larger adjustment of the opposite sign. We were right. There's a lot more methane leaking than we thought. Unfortunately, the IPCC says the effect of that methane on climate change is higher than we thought. The global warming factors, that factor of 86, used to be 72. Now it's 86. More methane is leaking, and the effect of methane on climate is going up. The situation is worse than we thought, and here is soot. That's black carbon from burn-offs at processing units in southwestern Pennsylvania. So carbon dioxide, methane, soot. Triple trouble. Two more figures, and then we're done. We get into Q&A. We're talking about effect of methane production for shale gas wells and climate change. Let's look at the big picture. Uh, this is a graph that comes out of a very prestigious journal called Science, uh, done by the scientists who write the IPCC report, and it's their best effort as of 2010, published in 2012, but as of 2010, their best effort to predict our climate future. I don't understand why the president doesn't show this in the State of the Union address. <laughs> I think the American people are capable of reading a graph. Do you ever notice that presidents, politicians, they really think we're stupid, that we can't read graphs? Okay, here's year. Here's 1900. Here's 2010. This is global warming, measured in degrees centigrade. Uh, since 1900, we've heated by eight-tenths of a degree centigrade. This is actual measured data. Notice how noisy it is. You, would you expect that? You're, you're making measurements at tens of thousands of locations around the planet. Would you expect that every year, at every location, you'd measure the same temperature? No, they're natural variations, so it's noisy. You'll notice that there are whole decades when the temperature went down. You'll notice that in some years it goes down, other years it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, goes down, goes up. But the trend is clear. Two colors, 
This is what we call the last warning zone. It starts at 1.5 degrees. This is the danger zone. It starts at 2 degrees. It's danger because the 2 degrees, science says, really, really bad feedback mechanisms kick in. If, it's, if the climate warms too much, then you start melting a lot more of the Greenland ice cap. You start melting a lot more of the polar ice cap. You start releasing more methane from the Arctic. Uh, ocean temperatures goes up. As the ocean temperature goes up, its ability to absorb carbon dioxide goes down. These are feedback mechanisms that are bad. The warmer things get, the worse those get, and the warmer it gets, and the worse those get, and that's called runaway greenhouse effect. You fall off the edge of the cliff. You don't want to get here. You certainly don't want to get here. So back in 2010, they ran computer simulations to predict the future. That's the best you can do with science. You can't tell somebody exactly what's going to happen in the future. You can take the best available science, the best available scientists, the best available, biggest powerful computers, and you do what's called Monte Carlo simulation. You roll the dice. You run the computer program with a bunch of inputs. Each of those inputs represents some factor that's very important, and then you vary the factors. And you do that again and again and again and again until you have statistical significance. You looked at the whole scope of what could happen. And they did that for four scenarios. This is business as usual. So predicting from 2010 forward, if we continue to increase the rate at which we're producing and burning all fossil fuels, which is what we're doing, we've been doing that since 1780, we've been increasing the rate at which we're producing and burning fossil fuels on the face of the earth. This isn't the United States, this is the world. That's business as usual. And it says we will get to 1.5 degrees by 2010, 20, 2030. When's that? It's tomorrow. 2030 is 100 years from now. 2030 is, is less than a half a generation from now. We're all going to be alive in 2030. And we get to the red zone in 2042. Now, the computer models aren't perfect. Can't be. They're models. So here are the, here's the error bar. See that line right there? So we could be off. We could be here in 2070. Or we could be here, just barely getting into the two degrees in 2070. When will we know which one was right? This is a real-time experiment. We're, we're, we are participating in this experiment. Okay, second scenario. Let's suppose that in 2010, all the world leaders and all the industries agreed we have to stop increasing the rate of carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, hold the line. Keep, emission, keep emissions of carbon dioxide at the same level that they were in 2010 for the foreseeable future. The computer model says we get to the warning zone same year, we delay getting into the red zone by five years. Worth doing? We could do better. We could have 2010 started to decrease, not hold the line, but actually decrease emissions of carbon dioxide, but we didn't. So we're now four years past this, by the way. So the temperature now is here. Okay, and so we have less time than we used to have. Next scenario. Uh, forget about carbon dioxide. Let's just try to hold the line on methane and black carbon. <coughs> Keep emissions of methane and black carbon constant. That puts us on this curve. And it delays our getting into the yellow zone until 2042, and it delays our getting into the red zone until 2060. Gives our kids and grandkids a chance. but we didn't do that. And finally, the best scenario would be, would have been in 2010, to hold the line. Don't increase the production, don't increase the burning of carbon dioxide, methane, or black carbon. And the computer model says, we have a chance of never getting into the red. Now, we could be wrong, because this, this computer model right here has this error bar. 
So we could be up here, which means we could be in the red, but not until about 2070. All the science that we talked about tonight is embedded in there. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a thousand years. Methane only stays in the atmosphere for about 15 years, but it has a much more profound effect by a factor of 86 over a 20-year period. So if you, want to carbon, if you want the atmosphere to react quickly, it can only react quickly to methane and soot. It can't react quickly to carbon dioxide changes. And you can't suck large amounts of carbon dioxide that's already up there out of the atmosphere. We're stuck with that. Last, last graph coming up. This is science. These are the world's best scientists telling you what, in 2010, was their best, in 2012, what their best estimates were of what was going to happen. The next graph I'm going, to, I'm going to give you comes from the United States Government Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration. It's not science. It's economics. 1980, 2040. This is the United States Energy Information Agency, IEA, which is a branch of U.S. Department of Energy, forecast for U.S. <coughs> primary energy consumption by fuel. So here's the history as of 2011, which was the latest report that they put out last year. 26% of our energy consumption was coming from natural gas, 8% from renewables, 8% from nuclear, 1% from liquid biofuels, 20% from coal, and 36% from oil and based wholly and solely on economic forecasts it has nothing to do with climate change. There's no constraint, there's no restriction, there's no requirement for the EIA to say, but wait a minute, we can't make this prediction because if we do, we all die. Here's what the government says is going to happen in 2040. 28% will be natural gas, 11% will be renewables, 9% nuclear, 2% liquid, 19% coal, 32% oil. Business as usual. That's all the above. That is all the above. <coughs> there it is, all the above. Do you really think that if we get to 2040 and only 11% of all the energy consumed in the United States is coming from renewables, we're we having a conversation about it? <coughs> so I'm going to leave you with a, the formal part of my presentation to you with that. Keep that in mind. That's what the science says. 2040 is that dotted line. And if we have business as usual, we're here. And here's DOE saying 2040, that's where from an economic, purely economic point of view, business as usual, that's where we'll be. Obviously, they're incompatible. You can't have this and not have that. I don't know how much clearer I can say it. So. Thank you very much for paying attention. I hope we still have substantial time to get all those wonderful questions addressed. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Who wants to go first with those questions? I'll we'll start on any one of them. Why don't we take them in the order and we'll say we're asked. I think the first one came from back. Yes, what was it again? Oh, I got it. Remember. Okay, so for those of you who don't, who don't know what's going on here, uh, over the past two months, a group of four professionals, um, a petroleum geologist, uh, a retired mobile executive, a retired oil and gas investor, uh, and a retired systems engineer decided to figure out how much money they're going to make if they lease their land. They're all landholders in New York. And they had heard, hey, we can get rich. How rich are we going to get? There was a lot of experience in that four group, group of four people. And to make a long story very short, they set out over two years to take all the data they could find in Pennsylvania, just like I did for the weak, leaking wells. They went into the Pennsylvania database, looked at the production reports, gas production for all the Marsalis wells in Pennsylvania. And they found very, very strong patterns. The wells that were producing a lot of gas were wells that were very deep, where the shale was really thick, and if the wells weren't deep, and if the shale wasn't thick, the wells weren't very productive. If the wells were really deep, and the shale was really thick, they were very productive. Well, across the Marcellus, depth and thickness varies tremendously. And in general, as you go farther south in Marcellus, it gets deeper 
and it gets thicker. As you get farther north, it gets shallower and it gets thinner. What's north of Pennsylvania? Thank you. <laughs> so they put together a road show. They gave the talk and I moderated all, all these. The, one was in Manhattan, one was in Oneonta, and the most recent one last week was at the uh, SUNY, it was at the University of Binghamton. And what they show is a prediction of the potential of New York State to produce natural gas from Marcellus. And it sucks. Pardon the French. There is one little crescent of area in Broome County, which, depending upon the price of gas, obviously this all depends upon how much somebody's willing to pay for the gas. If you're willing to pay $100 a thousand cubic feet, all the wells will be productive. But we won't be able to afford the gas. <laughs> And what they found was in order for a well in the most productive part of New York, where the grass, where the shale was thickest and deepest, which is Broome County, where it's the thickest and deepest, the most productive wells there won't break even until the price of gas gets to about seven dollars a thousand. It's currently at about four fifty, four sixty, but we're in the middle of the winter. So during the summer it's going to go down to the threes. So it might be some years before which connects us to the other question, which is, what's this thing about liquefied natural gas export? Well, what's a good way to get the natural price, get the gas at natural price to go up? <laughs> export it. <laughs> oh, wow, now, now we're starting to think like energy executives here, right? Let's see, what we really want to kill coal, we really want to kill nuclear, we really want to kill renewables, we want to raise the price of all fossil fuels, we don't give a damn about climate change, once you figure that out, everything's obvious. Take our precious natural gas resource, which our president says will last us 100 years, at what price? And increase the value of it by exporting, of it, exporting it to Canada, Asia, and Europe to raise the price so that American consumers' cost of heating goes up. And more wells become profitable, including the wells in New York. So the answer to your question is, one of the first reactions to this talk was, you guys really screwed us. All this work we did for the last five years in New York trying to get a ban on fracking, why do we need a ban if they're not going to frack? Completely incorrect interpretation of what they did. What they did is empowered you with essentially important information about how the industry works, because they're from the industry. They understand the energy economics that we're just surfing over the, the tip of here. It's profoundly complex. And what they've done is told you under what circumstances the gas in New York can become valuable on the market. And they plotted for every county in New York what the value of the gas would have to be for a well in that location, depending upon thickness and depth, for the landowner to make any money. And for the state to get any money and for there to be employment. And we're never going to have 60,000 Marcellus wells in New York. The gas price would have to go up to $80 a thousand before we saw 10,000 wells. So excuse me, we've all been really, really naive, including the governor and the legislator, legislature and DEC and me, because I didn't know this five years from now, five years ago, because I didn't have the benefit of seeing five years of development in Pennsylvania. But we've all been incredibly naive. You know the phrase, the emperor wears no, wears no clothes? We're all naked. Everybody thought everybody was going to get rich, right? So we thought it was going to be a battle five years ago. The wealth of the many against the health of the many. Now it's the wealth of a few against the health of the many. The governor knows that. Why do you think he's sitting on it? You don't think he knows what these four guys found out? They found out what the industry has known for two years. DEC knows it, so the governor knows it. That's the explanation for the stasis that we're in. These four guys also investigated the Utica. There have been tens of thousands of wells drilled in New York that went through the Utica. All the wells I drove by on the way up here, those are Trenton Black River wells, just so you know. Trenton Black River is down here, Utica is here, Marcellus is here. You can't drill down to the Utica, um, to the Trenton Black River, without going through the Utica. When you go through a, a, a when you go through a formation that bears gas, you have measurements. 
Those are exploration wells. Any Trenton Black River production well is by definition a Utica exploration well. All that information is in the files of all those companies that drilled all those wells. Ain't no gas in Utica. Now wait a minute, let me explain why. Oh, there's some, just like there's some in Marcellus. The deeper it is, the hotter it is. It's just not, that's geology. The deeper the rock, the hotter it is. The deeper the rock, the older it is. If a rock has been underground longer and hotter than a rock above it, and the rock above it doesn't have very much gas in it, you can be sure that the rock below it has less. Got it? So these same four guys are showing in their graphs and plots. What can you expect from the Utica? They even went further and said the latest thing is, oh, but look at all the gas above the Marcellus. There are other layers of shale between us and the Marcellus. Here the Marcellus is literally right under our feet. It's a few hundred feet down. You can't get, you can't drill it. But they're, they're, if you go down to Pennsylvania, New York line, you might not be able to get something out of the Marcellus, but they're saying, well, how about the layers of shale gas above the Marcellus? Well, they're shallower and they're thinner. So these guys did a fantastic service. And again, they're getting, they're getting criticized not only from the industry, because the industry didn't want you to know this, they're getting criticized from us, our colleagues. Many of the, of the uh, grassroots organizations that we fought with for the last five years are criticizing these guys for stealing their thunder. <coughs> oh my God, truth really hurts, doesn't it? You're empowered by truth. What was the next question? Yes, uh, all their presentations are now available. And I would advise, if you're going to see them, see the latest one at SUNY Binghamton, which was just last week. Email me. If you want to know where to find them, email me. You know how to find me, and I'll point you to them. But if you could just Google uh, potential of shale gas in New York State, you'll find it. Let's say they don't do the hydrofracking. They bring liquefied natural gas facilities into New York and permit that. All the pain, none of the gain. That's what they wanted to entitle their presentation. I don't think people know about this. No. So if, if New York State is going to be a conduit for pipelines and is going, to, is going to facilitate the exportation of natural gas and the creation of liquefied natural gas for exportation, if New York is going to participate in that, we get all the pain and none of the gain. Because the gas ain't going to come here. It's not going to lower your fuel bills. And we're going to have the compressor stations, the pipelines, the processing units, and we're taking the waste. And potential Yeah. And we're all downwind. Did you notice recently that we used to get a lot of weather patterns from Canada? Yeah. Now they're coming yeah. from Pennsylvania. Well, how about that? All the ozone being produced by all the methane leakage and all the pads in Pennsylvania. What was the what was the next question that was asked? Did you have one? I have one. Go ahead. I have kind of a two-part question. One, you showed a graphic showing all those uh, plots for uh, Pennsylvania leases. Mm -hmm. uh, are those all um, approved and underway, or was that a those are those are good question. So I showed two slides early in my talk. One was Bradford County, one was Tioga County, one was Shell, one was a whole lot of operators. And the question is, are are those all approved uh, leases? Yes, those are permitted leases. Not all of those leases have been completely developed. Some of them only have one well. Some of them have 15 wells. Some of them have 10 wells that have been drilled, none of which have been fracked. See, when you drill a well, you don't have to immediately frack it. To drill the well costs you $3 million. To frack it costs you $2 million more. So there have been 8,000 Marcellus wells, plus or minus, drilled in Pennsylvania since 2002. Only about 4,000 of them have been fracked. So that goes into the, the calculus, the capital calculus. Um, companies are constantly trying to balance their... their, their, their spreadsheets, <laughs> uh, their cash flow. Uh, to drill a well and put it into production is going to cost five to six million dollars. 
you either have to, you either have that capital in the bank, like Exxon, Chevron, BP, or you don't. There's 70 companies trying to produce shale gas wells, trying to produce shale gas in Pennsylvania today. 70. Most of them have to go to Wall Street to borrow the money. To borrow the money, they have to have a good rating, which means they have to have a high share price. They have to show that they have reserves. You go to the bank, they're not going to give you the money because you look good. You got to have something that has a value. What's that called? Collateral. So you have to say, but we own the access to all this gas. Uh, and if you loan us the money, we will produce it. But you can't put all the wells in the production right away because if you put too many wells in the production right away, what happens to the price of gas? Okay. So they're like, caught between a rock and a hard place, right? They want to produce a lot of gas so that they can export it. They want to produce a lot of gas to prove that they got the reserves, but the more gas they produce, because we have a finite demand for it in this country, which is actually decreasing because renewables are on the rise, the price stays low. They got themselves painted into a really bad corner. And only politics is going to save them, because the economics doesn't work. That's what these four guys, I've learned from them in the last two months. You guys are brilliant. Yeah.